in the heart of Silicon Valley. This is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Hi, I'm John Furrier inside the cube for the Extraction Point with John Furrier, where we get the signal out of the noise. And our guest today is the CEO of Nirvonics, Scott Genero. Scott, welcome to the cube inside my new show, Extraction Point. Thank you for being for inviting me. And we are the, the Extraction Point today is Cloud Wars. Uh, obviously, we've been covering cloud um, for a long time, over the past year and a half now, in depth. And now with the emphasis of big data and data and all this conversion, cloud, big data is collisioning together. Um, there's a massive surge in this uh, inflection point around cloud moving into uh, compute. And, and, and Scott, you, you're with Nirvonix. Tell us about your angle on what's happening with the cloud business. You're the CEO. Nirvonix is a three-year-old startup that's growing like crazy. They have great product leadership, have huge customers. They brought you in over the past uh, couple months, six months? Uh, nope, actually going on four. Four months now to take it to the next level, ramp up and scale. So tell us about what's going on in the cloud business and your new role at Nirvonix. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm real excited about being at Nirvonix. Uh, you know, I spent a long time looking before I came over, and you know, I came to the conclusion based on technology and uh, what's happening in the market that it was just time. Um, you know, I like to tell people that I always thought Nirvonix was kind of a diamond in the rough a little there. Um, you know, clearly I was brought in to accelerate. Um, you know, sales, marketing, which is really kind of my expertise when you kind of net it all out. And I think, as usual, it's a normal transition from a startup, right? You start out, you're smaller, you're doing development, you move on and to the next level, next level. So, um, you know, I, I'm excited about being here. I mean, obviously, there's a lot going on in the industry around cloud. Um, good, bad, or indifferent, one of the things that I find the most interesting is that um, cloud is so hot right now, everyone is using the word cloud on just about everything, even if it's not cloud. Um, I think uh, you call it cloud, what'd you call it, cloud? I call it cloud washing, and yeah. I actually put a little I think, link to a definition. Um, but what do you think of cloud washing? You, that term's being kicked around. When I first heard it, I was like, what the heck is that about? You right. Know, it's like, you know, washing doesn't sound very favorable, but what is it? It's just, you know, bullshit, cloud bullshit, or what is it? Well, there's a lot of companies <laughs> out there today that are using the word cloud on um, solutions that aren't even cloud, you know, real cloud, if you want to call it that, right? And um, I can go down a lot of different companies that are doing that, but the one that's most obvious to me um, is probably one of the largest storage companies out there, and that's EMC. You know, EMC has a product called Atmos. EMC has hardware that they sell with it. Um, but you know, when you net it all out, one of the things that's really key to the word cloud is usage-based pricing. And I think that's really important. And you know, EMC does not offer usage-based pricing. And by the way, to be fair, probably for a lot of reasons they don't, right? You know, I mean, I think it'll impact their mm -hmm. business pretty dramatically. True cloud offerings are very, very disruptive because of usage-based type pricing. And uh, it's not something they offer today, right? So I would argue that what they're offering today is cloud washing, right? You know, it's- oh, You're saying EMC's yeah. offering cloud washing. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a true cloud offering today, right? Now, so what, what, are the, what are the true clouds? So what, what, by the way, what they'll tell you is, is that they're offering it, there's technology to companies that will offer cloud. Um, personally, my feeling is, is that when you offer a V-block mm -hmm. expensive hardware device with software wrapped around it, uh, it's no different than probably five years ago when we had information lifecycle management out there, right? And by the way, mm -hmm. I was at Itachi. You know, we had similar solutions that we had at the time, the same thing. But when you have to write a big check for a million dollars up front for a bunch of capacity that you might not use mm -hmm. for a while, uh, that's not cloud, no matter how you net it out. Um, what we do, which is usage-based, mm -hmm. multi-tenant, um, what we do, which is... Oops. Oh, sorry about that. A little technical echo. difficulty. <laughs> echo there. Um, you know, when we go through that um, and the flexibility... So with the big private cloud, I mean big cloud players, Amazon. Amazon. Rackspace. No um, Google. Yeah, so... I mean, Google I, doesn't really have usage no, free. No, actually, I mean, when I net it all out, I, I think there's really two areas when I look at competition for what we do, right? Um, now... Even though I just said that EMC doesn't have a, what I would call a true cloud offering, my personal opinion is, is that because they are who they are, um, and they're a phenomenal marketing machine, if you want to net it all out, they can come out with nothing, right? And position it, and a lot of people will look at it, right? I mean, they have a huge install Well, they had some great marketing with well, this last announcement. Well, yeah. I mean, you saw the mega launch you know, they had. Um, they we, have, we were there covering it. Cloud meets big data, it's good positioning. It seems right, right? Right, so, you know. So that's so, cloud washing? Yeah. 
well, they're a marketing machine. That's not true cloud. It's not a true cloud offering. I guess that's my point, right? Amazon, on the other side, really does have a cloud offering. There's no question about that. You know, they're S3 technology. Now, what that is really is, though, is very much focused on, you know, development, development environments. It's very much focused on an environment that if you need extra, you know, capacity, it's kind of a burst area to go do that. Develop, it was a development environment created by developers for developers, right? Um, we focus on the enterprise space, and I think that's really important. And you guys, your model's all usage. It's usage-based. There's no question about it. And I also offer probably something that's very different, where Amazon only offers a public cloud offering um, in their locations. I offer a public location you know, offering like that, just like they do, um, but with a lot more functionality around it that's for enterprise class level um, customers. I also have what we call hybrid cloud. And once again, some of the terminologies that I use other people use in a different definition. Someone needs to come out with a book that says this is the real meaning of what private cloud, hybrid cloud, you know, and some of these words mean. But um, I have a hybrid offering, and what my hybrid offering is is that I will take what I have in my public data centers, if you want to call it that, and I will put it into a customer's environment. Um, now, I'll still charge them usage base based on what they utilize and how they do it, right? And I think that's important. But there are companies out there that, mainly financial institutions, that are probably still more risk adverse, if you want to call it that. And based on that in their environment, um, we offer to put it in their data center and their four walls. It's usage based and we still manage it. So I give them all the benefits of cloud um, that they love, yeah. but I put it in their world, right? So that's hybrid, right? I also can do a private cloud. And the nice thing about my hybrid cloud is that in addition to the fact that it's in their data center, you can also create a cloud federation that allows them to move into the public if they want to, and you can copy from that. So I have public, I have hybrid, I have private, and I also have a data mover. There's a lot of companies out there today, and there's a lot of confusion in the cloud space. Um, sometimes people, when they want to talk about cloud storage, what they want to talk about is uh, startups out there like Nasuni and Certas and those types of companies, which by the way, they're appliances. Um, they're data movers, and that's what we call them. I also have a data mover called Cloud NAS. Um, now, that being said, I'm also certified with all these Talk about guys. data mover, because a lot of people don't get what data mover is. I mean, well, it's, so, it's a term that's used in, in the industry, but what, to break that down. Yeah, so, you know, if you have, uh, take a customer A, he's got his current data, you know, on his storage products today and his infrastructure, right? And you want to move that into the cloud. You need something to be able to move that data, and that's what I call a data mover. A lot of people call them appliances, um, but there's different ones, and I think it's important. First of all, there's appliances like the startups, like Nasuni and Certos and Twinstrata, and there's a, there's a handful of them out there, right? First generation products just starting to ship out there across the board. By the way, Riverbed also has one. They just came out with their own. And those are hardware type you know, um, implementations, appliances. There's also companies out there like Symantec, and Commvault that also have a cloud interface into cloud providers. Now for Symantec, for you know, uh, Net Backup and Backup Exec, we're the only cloud provider that's integrated into that technology today. And that's important because, you know. The security points on the, on well, the transition, right? Not only that, 90 to 95% of the Fortune 500 install base has that product installed. You know, they dominate in that space for backup. I mean, so it's a great partner for us to be partnered with to yeah. kind of go drive that. Um, but you have the software companies, right? And then on top of that, there are many companies that could write to our APIs uh, across the board, and those are more application companies. So take, um, you know, a FileNet, a, you know, uh, you know a, a, a digital, um, you know, media type, asset manager type company could write to those, and that could also move the data into it, right? But I think the important thing about the data movers, um, and this is a terminology that we use a lot, is that you know, they're an on-ramp to a freeway, right? There, there's nothing else there. You need the storage in the back end, you need the file system in the back end to move it to. So those companies by themselves is not cloud storage. So they're a data mover. You know, they're an appliance or a software or whatever you want to call it to move that data into it. I'm the only cloud provider out there today that has an appliance, be it my own, um, I also have a public offering. I also have a private offering. I also have a hybrid offering. I'm cloud agnostic. I can go into any large enterprise customer and create a cloud infrastructure for them um, that nobody else can do. Everybody else who has a cloud offering has one of those, but nobody has all of it like we do. 
I'm here with Scott Jenner, the CEO of Nirvana. So I'm John Furrier with uh, SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, uh, on the extraction point. And uh, we're here talking about cloud, the cloud wars, uh, and to extract out the real points. And just want to point out for the folks uh, who are watching this video, there's a little uh, QR code at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen you'll see there. Click on that with your camera. We're, we're doing a little test to see who can click through on that. Get your camera out, your Android phone or iPhone, infrared that and go to the website we're keeping track on the stats we want to do a little test and then people will click on that and just something we might be playing with in the future okay so we're here with scott genero ceo of nirvana scott let's talk about the nirvonics and the marketplace and where you guys stand as a company vis-a-vis -vis competition and what you're talking to your customers about so nirvonics three-year-old company classic startup situation that hits it big gets a product, gets a team together, founding team, builds some product leadership, starts getting some customers and saying, wow, right. getting some traction. Um, add to the fact that the, the world spins in their direction with cloud being super hot mm -hmm. and relevant with what customers want to do. Right. So Nirvonics gets you know, into this with a great product, good customers. Talk about that and then talk about what you're seeing now in terms of in the market. So talk about the product and the customers right. that you have. Right, so um, you know, as I mentioned, we can offer different solutions to customers, right? And I think that's key. Our focus is enterprise, which I think is really important. Um, you know, we have some very large customers. And when you look at customers today, there's a lot of companies out there who talk about that they're getting close to their, you know, 50th customer or 100th customer. You know, we have over 700 plus customers, right? Um, and we have everything from, you know, little what's, SMB. What's the top, what's the major inflection point for Nirvana? I said, wow. This is going to be big. We need to get some leadership in and grow this puppy to a billion dollars. Right. What was that? What well, was that you know, catalyst? Yeah, I think it's a couple certain things. Certain profile customers, certain types of deals. Well, I think it's a couple things, right? Um, part of it is the market. You know, we've been around for three years and we have a very proven technology. We're on our second generation technology today. Most everyone else is just delivering their first, you know, generation. And we'll be rolling out our third generation um, probably in the next six to nine months. Um, so there's good and bad about being around for three years, right? The goodness is, is that we have a proven technology, we got the early adopters, we've got some very large customers, we understand this market probably better than anyone else. Um, the interesting part about it is the fact that in the first 18 to 24 months, a lot of evangelizing, right? You're out there, you're pitching the story, you're talking about cloud. Um, if you were sitting here 18 months ago and talked about cloud, uh, a lot of customers would have been, oh, I'm not sure if I'm ready for that, right? Today, in the last probably 90 days, I've visited easily 30 to 40 customers' prospects. Um, I've been all over New York. I'm in New York every other week. And I will tell you that I have not walked away from one meeting where a customer wasn't interested in doing something with us, either a follow-on meeting or a proof of concept, right? So the market's there. There's no question. So that's one proof point, right? And, and, and then once again, for us, we can look at it and think, hey, the, the customer behavior of today versus 18 months ago is radically different. I have customers that we were talking to. So they were skeptical, you're saying, 18 months ago, ah, you know, it's cloud, I might you know, kick the tires maybe, now to let's get some things in motion. I, I've got customers that we were talking to 12 months ago or 18 months ago who are now just closing business with us because they were kicking the tires, right? And now they're like, we're ready to go do this, let's go do this. So that's, I think that's, number one. I think that's really important. I think the second thing for us has been that we've closed some very large customers. I have customers who have multiple petabytes of storage um, you know, in our um, management of our, of, of our uh, public cloud. Um, and I will tell you right now, I, I don't think anyone can claim that they have customers that have multiple petabytes of data that they're managing today for one customer. Right? And we have multiple customers that have hundreds of terabytes, if not petabytes of data that we're managing today. Is there a certain vertical that you're seeing those kinds of petabytes? Is it, uh, well, is it, digital, is it digital entertainment? Is it financial? Yeah. It's a, it's, hospitals it's a, verticals? Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. It's, um, it's a couple things, right? You know, first of all, archival is big. And when you look at large blocks, unstructured type of data, um, you know, rich media, healthcare, biotech, you know, those areas obviously are very big, right, mm -hmm. across the board. But because of our semantic relationship and because of just backup, 
regular backup. By definition, that's really not considered unstructured um, large blocks of data, but it's low performance, right? You back it up, you probably never access it again. So that goes across all verticals, right? When we're talking about yeah. those types of customers and what we're doing. And we're seeing a lot of play there in the financial institutions. You know, there's a lot of interest there on what I would call typical backup type environments um, back to our, um, you know, to our environment. Look, talk about the marketplace as you're competing. You're going on your sales calls, and you're, mm -hmm. you're a very competitive person, obviously being, being in the sales and marketing background. Um, Amazon. I just wrote a post last week about Netflix and Amazon. Right. In the extent that you know, companies like Netflix are outsourcing using Amazon Cloud, mm -hmm. when in a sense Amazon could be a potential competitor. Right. Um, Amazon's big. Is it, are they too big? Are they, you know, some people have said, even Joe Tucci, the CEO of EMC, would say, you know, SLA, it's not even in their dictionary. Right. So how does... How do they compete against you guys? And are they hitting a glass ceiling in terms of the enterprise? Are they getting any traction there? And how do you guys talk about that? Yeah, so interesting enough, I don't see Amazon a lot in the enterprise space, right? I run across them a lot in that mid-tier space and clearly in what a, if it's a developer type yeah. environment. Um, there's definitely some skepticism regarding Amazon and just because who Amazon is. Amazon and Google, there's a lot of people who are concerned of, are they getting too big and what are they going and what they're doing? I, I, I discount that. Um, you know, across the board. I mean, you know, that, that's not what I get into. You think that's just rhetoric? I, yeah, I mean, you it's know, just, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a generation of people who are being raised. You know, I have two boys who are 18 and 20, and trust me, they have absolutely no issue with an Amazon or a Google, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm sure there's and people, Facebook too, for yeah, that matter. Exactly. So, um, but I think the major difference between us and them when we compete against them is more around the fact that we understand how to compete and how to support an enterprise customer. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we have built into our file system that allows customers to manage our infrastructure differently. Um, and I think that's really key, right, and important across the board. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we do around security. I think there's a lot of things that we do around enterprise support. I'll give you an example, and it's public information. You know, enterprise prize support, Amazon just announced that they're going to do that for $185,000 a year. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess you can buy a body or two for that. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty expensive. You know, our cost per gig, which is very comparable to an Amazon type model, when you look at it compared to a customer to customer, includes an enterprise level support. Um, we don't charge 185000 or a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on top of it. That's ridiculous, right? It just shows you how far away and removed they are from it. Um, you know, they use their data centers. I mean, in, in theory, what they're doing is they're using extra capacity that they're not using and they're selling out, which is great. Um, we've created a company that focuses on driving, um, you know, enterprise type support. And by the way, I want to make sure it's clear. Someone asked me this question recently. Does that mean we only focus on the enterprise? And the answer is no. The, the benefit that you get um, if you're not a total enterprise type customer is the fact that you get enterprise levels of service level agreements and support, even if you're not, right? Because we can offer it across the board. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's also, you brought up a good point. What is the definition of an enterprise these days? And there's always been that gray area between service provider and enterprise right. in, this, in this economy. Right. Um, okay, so other competition. I mean, Rackspace, um, Zeta, they might be coming on the cube. Um, Obviously, you mentioned EMC. Right. Um, what What is the big thing about Nirvana that's differentiated? I mean, you talk a lot about the right. product. What What right. can you What are the top three things you tell prospects and your clients and on Nirvana? One, two, three. What is right. the top three? Well, I, I think I think there's a couple things. First of all, around the competition, um, I, I tend to once again I see Amazon kind of at that lower development level um, across the board. They're, they've done a really good job of integrating into developers, if you want to call it that. It's small files, it's small data, it's not like big, big customers. You know, you brought up Netflix earlier. Um, that's the one I keep hearing. I've heard it now for the last six months. I've never heard them bring up anyone else but Netflix. Of course, I did read an article last week that said that, you know, they might be actually coming out with a offering that competes with Netflix. So, Maybe there's an opportunity there too. That's what uh, I wrote in my post about. So there's a conflict of interest. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, Netflix is basically financing, right? Amazon. Right. Exactly. So it's, it's, a, it's and, an interesting yeah. dilemma. Um, Supplier turned competitor. Right. I mean, I I, I don't see I, what I compete with a lot on the enterprise level is EMC going in there trying to convince customers not to do cloud um, usage base, but kind of to go in and talk about um, implementing their software and writing a big check. So, you know, they're in there pitching the story of private cloud, hybrid cloud, they're calling it. But the reality is, the great thing is, is that if I follow behind them and I say, I can do that too, and yeah. oh, by the way, I can offer true usage base, it's great, right? 
Um, you know, so I think that's really important. Um, the smaller guys, uh, you mentioned Zeta. I don't see Zeta anywhere. Um, I know Zeta says they focus heavily on enterprise. I don't really see them. Um, I ran into them into a conference about three months ago. I asked them who their biggest customer was. Um, the person at the booth kind of stuttered a little, threw out a 25 terabyte number, and I'm like, 25 terabytes, oh my God, that's like my SMB guys, right? So I don't know who their big customers are. I don't know what they're using. <laughs> and your biggest customer is multi, how, many, mu how many petabytes? It's multi-petabytes. And you have multiple customers doing I have multiple. multiple. I have multiple customers that have over hundreds of plus terabytes. Okay, and so what's your annual sales now? And we don't disclose that. We're a private, privately owned company. Uh, interesting enough, nobody discloses uh, this information, including Amazon. Ah. And it's not something that we But do. you're not I mean, I mean, you got over 700 plus customers, multiple customers over hundreds of petabytes. Mm -hmm. I mean. 100 terabytes. 100 terabytes, I mean petabytes. Right. Um, you're not giving the product away for free. No, so no, no. You're, we making, make, we, you're making some money. We make good margin. You guys are doing pretty yeah. well financially. Yeah, I mean, our plan is to continue to grow. We're hiring salespeople, SCs. We're currently uh, continuing to invest in engineering. Um, you know, we've brought in a new marketing team. Obviously, we're out non-disclosing and, and doing briefings across the board. Do you think the cloud washing is going to kind of die down a bit and the hype will kind of turn into reality? I mean, talk about growth from your perspective, because you're on the streets, you're, you're mm -hmm. seeing the signals. Um, do you feel the thermal coming in, the growth hit, hitting right now? You mentioned it. Yeah. I mean, where do you peg the evolution of the hype cycle? Then it hits the trough and then it kicks up again. Are we yeah. in that up, uptick? Yeah, I think, I think we saw a lot of hype over the last 12 months, cloud, cloud, cloud. I also think uh, a lot of the cloud conversation has been around cloud compute. And once again, that's another one. I get in a lot of conversation with the people and they want to talk about cloud and they're really talking about cloud compute, right? We offer cloud storage. Um, we don't offer cloud compute. We offer cloud storage that's standalone. You can put it to cloud compute if you want to, um, but most companies do not offer cloud storage by itself. They offer cloud storage um, that's attached to cloud compute. And the reason I bring that up is because a lot of our um, billing capabilities, a lot of our management tools and everything else are different when you're managing storage by itself versus it being attached to, yeah. you know. Well, we're here, well, you know, you're obviously here live in Palo Alto. We're at the Cloud Air office where we sublease and we co-locate with, with the guys from the Hadoop community. Mm -hmm. um, they're seeing that same thing. I mean, it's all about storage and the scuttlebutt in the community of the alpha geeks in Silicon Valley and beyond is that there's an abundance of compute. The storage is the real issue and right. cloud does provide that. And, and um you know, Hadoop is just one example of the mm -hmm. open source way to go. Right. Uh, and you guys are another. Um, it doesn't seem to me that, I mean, we've been covering storage for a while, Dave Vellante and I, and Dave in particular. There hasn't been a lot of talk about storage clouds. It's been kind of clouds in general. Well, once again, I think, you know, that, and, and that's the issue, right? And there, in the industry, I mean, there's cloud washing, which is everybody putting the name cloud on everything, right? That's mm -hmm. different. And then there's just, everyone putting the bucket in. It goes back to my point around the appliances. I mean, I've actually met with customers who said, well, I'm talking to this company and this company, and I go, so where are you going to put your data? Well, what do you mean? Um, well, it, th there is no storage on the back end of that appliance, right? Um, they're like, oh, see, so there's a lot of confusion still in that industry. I, I'll give you a, a different example. I was with a customer, and they were talking about they were going to go to um, a company, uh, a service provider, and they were going to get cloud storage. And, and they said it was 3PAR, right? And by the way, 3PAR is a great product. Now HP. Yeah. So the interesting part was is that they couldn't get it unless they bought compute. But 3PAR has done a phenomenal job, or HP 3PAR, have done a phenomenal job of attaching that product to cloud compute in the service providers. The problem is is that if a customer just wants storage, they can't get it. They have to buy compute to get to the storage, right? That's very different. Customers today want a choice, and they want it all across the board, right? And I think that's very different. When does a company, let me ask you this question differently. When, uh, let me ask this differently. What's your sales again? <laughs> what's my sales again? A lot. <laughs> Hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, no, seriously, um, have you heard what's going on? You mentioned Riverbed, right? right? What's going on with these guys? I mean, right. you'd mentioned them earlier. Well, Do they have a cloud play? So, and what is it? Yeah, so Riverbed um, has an appliance. Right, it's a data mover if you want to call it that. Certified with our product, it's a great product. Um, Riverbed's a good company. I wouldn't underestimate Riverbed. I think they're going to be extremely aggressive, and I think they're going to go after that market pretty What's hard. What's their cloud push? I haven't, I've been hearing scuttlebutts well, about some things, but well, their cloud push for what we interface with them is once again, it's the data mover, right? Um, mm -hmm. They've put dedupe in there, they've put compression in there, they've put some cool functionality in there uh, across the board, 
and I think that's important. So, um, what's the size of the cloud market, and what's at stake in terms of uh, the opportunity? So. There's a lot of numbers out there, and some of them are cloud storage. Yeah. You can break it down if well, you have any. So, so the last numbers I saw from IDC, right, was roughly about 7.8 billion, you know, um, just for um, storage, you know, across the board, you know, by 2014. And I think, you know, the point is, is that that's a big number, right? Um, you, you asked me a question earlier. I thought it was interesting. I want to go back to real quick. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, Amazon. Um, I think Amazon in the market is actually good for me, and I'll tell you why. Is that normally when an emerging market pops up, there's four or five startups, right? And they do a couple million, and then they go to four million, and then they go to 10 and 20 and 50, and you know, eventually after three or four or five years, you know, you've got four or five companies out there, a couple that have done extremely well, and you know, they either go public or they get bought, right? Across the board. Amazon creates an interesting dynamic because they're not a small company and they have a lot of money. So unlike four little startups who are trying to you know, get their fair share and eventually one of them or two of them pop up to be the big guy, you've got a situation now where you've got a company out there that has a lot of money that's a big threat to, I'll call the bigger guys, the HPs, the IBMs of the world. <laughs> um, you know, if you believe the numbers out there that these guys, and by the way, when I talk about cloud, I'm talking about cloud compute and cloud storage, right? You know, I mean, 500 million to a billion five to two billion to three billion, some of the numbers are pretty gigantic. These guys are taking it from someone, and the people they're taking it from is IBM or HP or Dell or one of these big guys. So what does that leave? So if they want to have an offering, that's competitive to what Amazon is offering, who do they partner with? It makes a lot of sense for them to be partnering with us. I have a relationship with Dell today, I have a relationship with So H you guys are rolling up a lot of the HP emerging today. players, and so, that, so it's from what you're saying is, the strategy is having that big 800 pound gorilla in Amazon out there, you get the access to these emerging technologies and new opportunities. And then the semantics of the world with the existing right. players, right? Yep. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a real opportunity there across the board. And it creates a real threat day one to these bigger guys that they've got to react to it probably a lot quicker than they normally would have in a, in a, in a traditional startup emerging market. What does that mean for the, uh, the marketplace in terms of configuration? You know, you're talking about like smaller players, partnerships, you mentioned Symantec. I mean, Symantec's not a small company. McAfee just got sucked into Intel. Mm -hmm. That was announced today, final, finally uh, approved. Um, does it change? Does this new environment change how people are going to do business? Is it more partnering? Is it better to be nimble? What's your view on the marketplace? Kind of the horses that are on the track. What's happening? Yeah, well, there's, there's a huge consolidation going on already, which is interesting, right? I mean, Terramark got bought by Verizon. Who would have thought Verizon would have bought a cloud? I mean, if you read the information, it was because of their cloud offerings, right? Um, so a telco bought that. The moment that happened, another telco, you know, turned around and bought somebody else, right? So um, I think you're going to see... Um, a lot of different interesting players emerge here. Um, the telcos as service providers create competition for what? IBM Global Services? Mm -hmm. um, they create competition for EDS, for HP, right? It creates a different dynamic out there uh, than before. And they're clearly making investments to go do that. I mean, you know, the Terramark acquisition was what, 1.5 billion or something? That's, a, that's not a small little couple hundred, thousand, a couple hundred million dollar acquisition. I mean, they're clearly seriously going after it. Um, so I think it creates a whole different dynamic out there. Today, we look at and say um, that when you kind of net it all out, we used to always say, it, when I was at Hitachi, and I was at Hitachi Data Systems for a while, we used to sit there in a room and go, okay, it's, you know, it's HP, it's Dell, it's uh, you know, um, NetApp, it's EMC. Um, we could be sitting here in three or four years from now and saying that it's Nervonics, it's Amazon, uh, it's some of these service providers yeah. that are really driving this. And it'll be an interesting change in the market. Yeah, and you guys certainly have been getting a lot of press lately since you came on board. We're here with uh, Scott Genero, the CEO of Nervonics, uh, emerging, fast-growing cloud player, really in the, I want to call it private hybrid cloud, but you know, secure storage cloud, reliable with, with kind of SLA enterprise-like feel to it. Um, two final questions for you, Scott. Um, one. I don't, can't disclose 
was my revenue. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I already got that. <laughs> I'm, I'm working around them, kind of dancing around. I got 700 customers. I'm doing the math in my head. 700 plus. 700 plus customers. 701. Add, okay. Adding them all the time. <laughs> I'm thinking it's petabyte, uh, hmm, volume, usage base. I'm just doing the math. Okay. So you, you've got 700 plus customers, good product leadership. Now you've got a market growth plan that you're kicking right. into, into high gear, no doubt about that. Um, two things. One, what have you guys learned from working with 700 customers at that kind of level with petabyte kind of storage right. and scale? And down you mentioned SMB. What have you learned from that around what it takes to, to provide a product and value in the market? Right. Two, what's your plans going forward? Right. So I, I think the key is, is that um, this isn't something you can just pop in and walk away from. Um, on the low end, when you're talking to SMB customers and stuff, it's easy. By the way, you could go to my website, flip a credit card, and get a terabyte tomorrow for your home usage if you really wanted to, right? I mean, we do everything from that all the way up to the big support. But, I, you know, I want to go back to the reason there's a lot of differentiation of what we do when we support an enterprise customer um, that I think is important. Um, you know, and part of it is this concept that we own the, the total stack, right? You know, and I think that's really key. Explain that. Well, once again, we have a data mover, right? We can do public, we can do private. We can do private into the public once a customer already has all of that. It gives the customer a lot of flexibility to be able to manage it. And it also allows us to tune our products and make sure they're tuned for the enterprise space around performance capabilities and feature and function capability, right? Um, you know, and I think the key here is that cookie cuttering a cloud, as much as we want to say, go put the data off somewhere and you don't have to worry about it anymore, customers do worry about it. We approach cloud as another tier of storage, right? And it doesn't matter that if it's in their data center or if it's in my data center, it's another tier of storage. And when you think of it as another tier of storage, there are things that customers want to be able to manage and understand. And I think that's really important, you know, that we offer an enterprise class cloud that's very different. I'll, I'll give you an and example. And you've learned when, what you've learned over the past yeah, 700 customers later you've, is what? That at scale matters, support matters, is that what you're saying? Scale, support, um, you know, um, flexibility, I think that's key, is that we have customers who have direct, you know, uh, lines, um, you know, networking lines straight into our data center, right? We, uh, we allow that to happen today. Uh, some of our competitors won't let that happen, right? And I think that's really key across the board. Um, you know, so you do whatever it takes to integrate to the client. Whatever makes sense for the client, you'll do. We are, we, our, our offering is a service offering, right? It's not a box. And I think that's very, very different. We're Got not it. just selling capacity. We're offering a solution and a service. And when you do that, there is some stuff. I mean, I was meeting with a large prospect right up the street here, um, you know, before I came over. And, you know. Facebook? I, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, I can't disclose that Google? information. <laughs> but the interesting part is, is HP? that as we went through it, yeah, you can name probably 500 companies. Frank Quetron? <laughs> 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 but but when you net but when you net it all out, it's it's really interesting because you know they first said what's the price? We kind of went down that path, and I said, look, by the time we were done, um, I we came up with three or four potential use cases, um, and we said we need to come back in and really price this out and model it out because it's it's it petabytes and petabytes of data they're trying to figure out how to store. It's a nightmare for them to store it. They're trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. Um, but I think the interesting thing about it and is And you were the white knight for them, right? Well, the interesting about it is because I'm not just offering, here's my public cloud, go put it in there. Because if I had done that, they would never even met with me. But because I said I can do all these different things and I can basically structure a solution for them that makes a lot of sense, we had that meeting. They were hesitant when we walked in, like, I don't think you can do this. By the time we walked out, We've got our follow-up meeting, you know, and they want to come in and do, do a so deep So you guys dive. are getting the high end of the market. That's really, really, really well, that's cool. That's what we focus in on. Yeah. And I think that's important. I, I think... But you're not going to shut down the, the, the mid-range. No, the, not the at all. SMB. No. But I, most of your success is at the high end. I, well, yeah, I think the point is, is that most of our revenue and high margin comes from, you know what I mean, the, the higher end. And what type. percentage of your business is high end? <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Revenue wise, a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay, thirty eight percent of high end, big, big percentage, yeah. customers. So, but, but fifty I think, million in revenue. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think the other thing that's very different for us um, versus uh, some of our competitors is I get asked the question a lot about uploads and downloads. You know, are you charging me for uploading my data and downloading my data? And I don't. I give one cost uh, across the board, and that includes uploads, downloads 
cost per gig. It includes maintenance. It also includes tech refreshes. And I, I think this is an important part, and it really is resonating with customers across the board. Um, Every two and a half, three years, and I was one of these people, right? I'd walk in the door of my install base and I would say, hey, warranty's coming due. Got this big bill, you know, at the end. You're either going to have to start paying that or magically I'll figure out how to give you a tech refresh, give you new storage with some new features and functions, and, you know, you can move the data over. So if it was high availability, high performance type of data, you might argue, okay, that makes a lot of sense but only 20 to 25% of most customers' data is that type of data. For the type of data that we're talking about, which is lower performance archival type infrastructure, which interesting enough is about 65% of the data that's being created today, mm -hmm. um, and it's growing at 10X, right? So it's the biggest piece of data that customers are creating and what they're doing. But in that world, um, feature, function, all of that kind of stuff isn't really important. What they want is a very reliable, you know, low cost option to be able to do that. So, in a tech refresh, if you think about it, if you spent $500,000 for X amount of storage, you know, basically in about two and a half, three years, you're going to spend $500,000 again. Maybe it's four ninety, dollars right? And then in another three years, you're going to spend it again. And that feature, function, higher performance for this type of data is meaningless to me. And oh, by the way, I've made you move 50 to 100 terabytes every three years. It's a nightmare. Customers don't want that. For this type of data, they want something reliable that they can put out there for 10 years because the government the management requires cost. There's a, a cost of management. Yeah. So there's a huge cost to do So this. your plans going forward, I mean, obviously, you know, first of all, just to kind of, you know, get the questions out of the way, have you been approached about M&A? Have you been approached to be bought? Are you approaching me right now? No, I mean, from the, the big guys. I mean, obviously, the M&A market right now is pretty hot. You guys have a great product. Um, have anyone, you know, knocked on your door and said, hey, you know, you guys are it's a good, good deal. IBM's been buying, you know, companies that are, you know, Good prices, so you guys aren't public yet. You're private. Any offers? <laughs> not, 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 no, not, no comment. Not, no, no comment. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I, I think the important point, and I'll answer your other question, which kind of answers this question too in a different way. Um, you know, I mean, people are looking for this kind of solution. I mean, the big guys, no there's holes in and the we product have, and, we have a, and we have a great solution, right? And if you know, um, if at the right price, you know, it, 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 kind of standard uh, but, CEO but, line. Yeah, exactly. But our our plan is um, we're expanding our sales organization pretty aggressively. Um, we're rolling out a new channel program um, in the next quarter. We think there's a huge play in the channel. By the way, Amazon doesn't play in the channel. We think there's a huge play in the uh, you know channel across the board. We want to integrate deeper with our current OEM partners um, and create a stickiness of being able to come out with a you know combined solution that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then we're developing our third generation of product. We're currently in the process of doing that. We're going to roll that out in the next six to 12 months. So our plan is to keep this you know, guy rolling. We think the market is here. Um, we think the customers are ready. We think we have the install base to do it. Um, you know, in the next 12 months, we'll probably go out for another round of funding, which is kind of per plan as what we want to do. Um, and our plan is to grow. Um, yeah. Grow and grow and grow. And You guys are doing good. You're certainly hot. Product's been successful. I mean, I think the, the big testament's a 700 plus clients. I mean, it's a, it's a great market. It's growing, but to have that kind of number of clients is pretty pretty amazing so congratulations thank you and we're here with scott jenner the ceo of nirvonix hot startup in the cloud storage market uh, it's hot people people are looking for these kinds of solutions especially enterprise grade uh with reliability and quality and obviously the big guys out there like amazon have been very successful with developers and uh, usage-based pricing is is the is the model congratulations uh, that's it from the extraction point i'm john furrier